All right. Closing it out here. So in the emergency department, we are, of course, we are the champions of dealing with pressure. We handle critical resuscitations, agitated patients, and in administrator interrogations with ease. So while we are the kings and queens of stress, there are a few presentations that can make even us cry, save me, pregnant women and neonates. These populations cause a lot of stress, rightfully so. We see their critical presentations really rarely, and the stakes are obviously very, very high, as Dr. Fairbrother has told us earlier today. But it's important to remember that these postpartum patients can present with serious problems as well. So that's how we're going to round out our day today with postpartum emergencies, very specifically the hypertensive emergencies, presentations that can put both you and your patient under pressure. Before we get to the scary stuff, let's start with the hypertension that is not an emergency. So hypertension here is defined as a systolic blood pressure greater than or equal to 140 or a diastolic above 90. Now, blood pressure rises progressively over postpartum days one through five and peaks on days three through six after delivery. That's normal. Some degree of hypertension is going to be common and it isn't always something that we need to get super worked up over. But importantly, those are for patients who have no proteinuria, a fact that has been seared into my mind for decades ever since season one of ER when Dr. Green missed this diagnosis. Now, I'm really sorry to spoil an episode of television from 1995 for you, but I am going to do it. A pregnant woman presented with dysuria, frequency and urgency, along with some vague abdominal pain. And Dr. Green attributed that proteinuria on her dipstick to cystitis, kind of blew off her mildly elevated blood pressure and discharged her on antibiotics. She went on to have eclampsia and a series of unfortunate events, like literally every peripartum and neonatal complication imaginable, unfolded, and she died. And alas, as was often the case in ER, another one bites the dust. I was traumatized for life, although obviously not enough to avoid pursuit in an emergency medicine career. But these disorders have a really significant morbidity and mortality. And actually, in the United States, preeclampsia and eclampsia are one of the four leading causes of maternal death. For preeclampsia, we have the same blood pressure cutoffs, but now you add that proteinuria. Technically, the diagnosis requires a 0.3 gram or greater of protein in a 24-hour urine specimen. But obviously, we are not collecting a 24-hour urine specimen. So for us, a random urine protein measurement of 30 milligrams per deciliter or just one plus on the dipstick is suggestive of preeclampsia, not diagnostic, but for us, we'd, we would call it preeclampsia. Eclampsia is the occurrence of seizures in association with the hypertension and the proteinuria. And specifically, late postpartum eclampsia is defined as an eclamptic seizure that occurs more than 48 hours after delivery, but within four weeks postpartum. While the overall incidence of eclampsia is luckily decreasing, the relative incidence of late postpartum eclampsia, again, meaning more than 48 after 48 hours after delivery, the exact patient populations we can expect to be seeing is rising and now makes up somewhere around 15% of all eclampsia cases. Whether HELP syndrome is just a severe form of preeclampsia or it's a separate disease entity is still kind of a matter of controversy, but it's worth covering here because the presentations and the treatments definitely overlap. So just a reminder, HELP syndrome includes hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, and a low platelet count. In terms of the presentation, data is mixed as to whether patients with postpartum eclampsia have prodromal symptoms at all. In one case series of 45 patients, 40% 40 had no prodromal symptoms. But in another retrospective chart review of just 24 patients, 92% had at least one warning sign or symptom, and half of the patients, 12 of the 24 patients, had two warning signs or symptoms. What I think should be really concerning to us, though, is that of those patients, only one third sought any medical care for their symptoms. Of those that did, six of seven, most of them, the vast bulk of them, were discharged from the emergency department without any treatment at all. 
Now, part of the problem might be that one of the most common presenting symptoms is headache. And as we know, postpartum women have many reasons to have a headache, fluctuating hormones, sleep deprivation, auditory irritation all come to mind. And the differential diagnosis for headache is obviously quite broad. In one retrospective review of 95 women with severe postpartum headache, 39% were diagnosed with a tension headache, 24% with either eclampsia or preeclampsia, 16% with a postdural puncture headache, 11% with migraine, but the remaining 10%, a whole 10% were diagnosed with a serious condition like an intracranial hemorrhage, a mass, or a cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. And to complicate matters even further, as we all know from Hickam's dictum, patients can have as many diseases as they damn well please. There are case reports of patients who have eclampsia plus either a postural puncture headache, plus an intracranial hemorrhage, or plus a cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. So just keep in mind when you're dealing with a patient who's presenting with symptomatic postpartum um, hypertension or one of the disorders on that spectrum, you could be dealing with an eclampsia and patient. So of course you have to be thorough in your evaluation and don't prematurely close on preeclampsia eclampsia. In addition to the headache, you should be also looking out for things like confusion, malaise, vision changes, abdominal pain, nausea, and vomiting. All of these can be symptoms of eclampsia or even of HELP syndrome. Now, I mentioned that the patient may present with no symptoms, and they can progress rapidly from no symptoms to seizures. So your evaluation of any postpartum woman, regardless of their chief complaint, must include a complete set of vital signs and ideally probably two blood pressure readings during their time in your emergency department. Depending on their presentation, you're going to do whatever workup is appropriate for their severity of illness and their chief complaint. But the one extra thing I'm going to mention in terms of your exam, because we don't always do this routinely, is that you should be checking the deep tendon reflexes. Patients with preeclampsia, I'm sure you probably remember back from medical school and your GYN rotations, they typically have hyperreflexia. And actually, the degree of their hyperreflexia often correlates directly with the severity of their central nervous system, system hyper irritability. So go ahead and check those. Now, I think it's easiest to think of the diagnostics and the treatment together. And that's because I like to group these patients into three major buckets. I'm just like Celine. He likes to put things into buckets. I like to put things into the buckets. So the first bucket is the patient who presents with severe hypertension or, or severe features. These patients uh, will have notable lab abnormalities. So things like thrombocytopenia, transaminitis, renal failure, or they're going to have blood pressures over 160 systolic or 110 diastolic. So higher than our just hypertension numbers, or they might have both the severe hypertension and the lab abnormalities. Patients with these findings need treatment really regardless of whether they have any symptoms. So they're going to get either labetalol, 10 milligrams IV, or hydralazine, five milligrams IV. If IV access is a challenge, you can start with oral nifedipine at 10 milligrams. Of note, all of these medications, kind of going back to my talk from last year on lactation, all of these medications are considered safe for breastfeeding mothers. So don't worry, you can give any of these medications to these moms. And all of these medications can and should be repeated at regular intervals if the blood pressure is remaining elevated. This, of course, is a high pressure situation where time kind of starts to move funny. So if you are in this situation clinically, I would strongly encourage you to find your hospital's protocol or even look one up online from some other hospital system that has it published to kind of help you guide the time intervals of repeating these dosing and what doses you should be giving. Additionally, once these patients are into the severe features category, they have the more significantly elevated blood pressure or the lab abnormalities. They are presumed to have preeclampsia with severe features and they needed to be started on magnesium for their seizure prevention. So this is given as an initial bolus of four to six grams IV over 10 to 20 minutes, followed by a drip at two grams per hour. My next bucket of patients are those who are presenting with symptomatic hypertension. So for this, we're using that lower BP threshold, which should be triggering your concern. And in terms of symptoms, again, you're looking for things that I, I know all of you know, headache, confusion, malaise, vision changes. Don't forget about abdominal pain, nausea, and vomiting. 
In this case, you're going to get a urinalysis and you're going to check the reflexes. These are going to help you look for preeclampsia. And then you're also going to want to get a CBC, a complete metabolic panel. So including your liver enzymes to help you screen for help. Ask yourself, does this patient have either proteinuria or hyperreflexia? If the answer is no, you are not out of the woods. They still have symptomatic hypertension and things could escalate quickly. So consult your obstetrician. The ultimate dispo of this patient with the symptomatic hypertension, but as of yet, no lab features of preeclampsia, their dispo could potentially be in versus outpatient, but this should really be discussed with your specialist. This is super important because remember, we are getting a random urine specimen that we hope is an indicator of what a 24-hour specimen would look like, but lack of proteinuria on a random specimen cannot rule out definitively the presence of preeclampsia. Looking at the literature, albeit sparse, these are all relatively small studies. For postpartum eclampsia, somewhere between 40 and 55% of patients had no proteinuria on their initial screening labs. So we cannot use it to rule out, always get your consultant involved. Now, if we do have either proteinuria or hyperreflexia, for our purposes, this is diagnostic of preeclampsia. These patients are going to be started on your antihypertensives. Give them your seizure prophylaxis. Patients presenting with HELP syndrome. As I mentioned, they are more likely to have abdominal pain than the headache and or neuro symptoms that we're seeing in our preeclampsia and eclampsia. And of course, they're going to have at least some of the lab abnormalities that just make up the name. So if you find any of these on your screening labs, you're going to actually need to broaden the set of labs that you're going to order. So after you think you have HELP syndrome, go ahead and get some coagulation studies and a fibrinogen to help you look for evidence of DIC and a type and screen in case the patient needs a transfusion and a uric acid, as this might have some prognostic value that's helpful to our GYNs. Luckily, treatment goals are the same, prevent the seizure and control the blood pressure. You might have to give the patient a platelet transfusion, um, depending on their platelet count, if it's less than 20,000, or if you have any evidence of bleeding. Now, my last bucket are those who are coming in with asymptomatic. So say you had a woman who stubbed her toe while she was dealing with a 2 a.m. diaper blowout comes in and you happen to notice she's hypertensive. For these patients, it is recommended that you start oral antihypertensives, same meds as before. And then you can refer to follow up with your OBGYN or PCP in one to two days. Now, if that feels a little cowboy to you, starting a med and discharging the patient, I get it. Remember, I am still scared from an episode of television from 1995. So if this is more than just a little crazy little thing for you, go ahead and check for hyperreflexia and proteinuria. You're not going to be faulted and talk to your consultant. Now, well, I would like to say, don't stop me now. I want you to break free. So I will wrap it up. For me, these patients fall into three major categories. Those with severe features either more significantly elevated blood pressures or lab abnormalities who need immediate treatment regardless of their symptoms. Those with symptomatic hypertension who may need treatment depending on their labs and exam. And those with asymptomatic hypertension who you might just start on an oral medication and send home. But for all of these patients, we have two goals, control the blood pressure, with either labetalol, hydralazine, or nifedipine, all of which are safe for a lactating mother, and prevent the seizures with a magnesium bolus followed by a magnesium drip. And of course, of course, of course, the last thought I will leave you with is that when in doubt, consult OBGYN. While sometimes getting a consult can be a pain, in this case, it might just relieve you of some of your pressure. Thank you very much.